It's good to see you here tonight. I invite you to take your Bible, open, if you will, please, to 1 Kings in the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 13. We're studying the lives of kings in the Old Testament and learning from them, applying truth to life. And tonight we're going to look at chapter 13, verse 11, down to verse 34, the rest of the chapter. And tonight the title of the sermon is A Tale of Two Prophets. This is a story in the Bible that perhaps you've never heard preached on. It's a, one of the most bizarre stories in the Bible, I have to say. It's a story about two prophets. One of them is older and the other is younger. One is from Judah. Another is from Bethel uh, there in the kingdom of Israel. The prophet from Judah obeys the Lord. He obeys his specific command and then turns right around and disobeys that command. The prophet from Bethel tells a lie to the prophet from Judah, and then later tells him the truth. And then the prophet from Judah is killed by a ferocious lion, but the lion refuses to eat the prophet. And the prophet from Bethel, who lied to the younger prophet, uh, carries the body of the uh, man from Judah uh, to his home, his city in Bethel. He buries him in his own grave. He weeps over him the very man he destroyed by lying to him. Now, this is not the kind of story that you find in a children's Bible story book. It's, again, probably not the kind of story that you ever have heard preached on. The problem is the story raises a lot of questions that are hard to answer. And fundamental to some of those questions are questions about fairness. The story is troubling because it's hard to find out who are the good guys. Normally in an Old Testament story, we know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. But it's hard to discern who's who here in this story. Even the men of God who tell the truth in this story turn out to be liars and lawbreakers. But let me tell you what I think this story is. This story is really a living parable that sends a strong message to the divided nation. Remember, at this point in Israel's history, the nation is divided. You have Judah to the south. You have Israel to the north. This is a message to that divided nation. But also, it's a message for us tonight. We're not just here to learn about Israel's history. We're here to learn about truth that we can apply to our own life, right? All of these stories give us lessons that we can apply to us. So let me just break this story down for you. I want you to notice five parts to the story. Number one, if you're taking notes, write down a specific command. God gives the prophet from Judah a specific command. Now, if you were here with us last week, you saw that the king Jeroboam committed a terrible sin against God by setting up two altars, one in Dan, the other in Bethel, and with two golden calves. And he said to the people, these are your gods, O Israel, you worship them. Remember, Jeroboam did that because he was afraid if people kept going up to Jerusalem to worship, they would be disloyal to him. And so he sets up this false religious system. And one day he goes to Bethel to burn incense at this false altar, this pagan altar to this golden calf. And while he's doing that, suddenly appears a prophet from nowhere. This is the prophet from Judah, this younger prophet. And he basically preaches against that altar there. Now Jeroboam tries to seize him as if to arrest him. And when he reaches out his hand, his hand dries up and withers. He becomes paralyzed. Graciously, the prophet prays for the king, and his hand returns to normal. This was a miracle that affirmed that this prophet was truly from God. And Jeroboam, however, he doesn't really repent. What he does is he tries to persuade this younger prophet to come with him, come to his house, let me feed you a meal, let me reciprocate, let me give you a gift. And he was trying to persuade him really to become a part of his kingdom. He could use a prophet like that who had that kind of power. But notice what the prophet says to him. Look in chapter 13. Look down in verse number 8. After the king offers him refreshment in verse 8, And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. God made very clear what this prophet was to do. And by the way, by refusing the king's offer, in a way, the prophet was shaming the king. Think about this. This was an ancient Near Eastern custom. It was called the custom of equal reciprocation. If you gave someone a gift, then you were obligated to uh, 
the, 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 the person who received that gift was obligated to reciprocate by giving a gift back. What gift did the king receive from the prophet? Well, the king had his hand healed. The king wanted to reciprocate by giving him gifts, but the prophet said, no, I don't want your gifts. And by doing that, by refusing that invitation, he was violating a very strong custom, but he was doing it on purpose to shame the king, not only to shame the king, but everyone in that location, everyone in that locale, in the city of Bethel and that altar were all included in that refusal, which brought great shame. Look in verse number 10 where he says, so he went another way and returned not by the way that he came. He went out a different way, and the reason for that was to avoid contact with people who would want to reciprocate him with gifts or rewards or invitations. But God's command was clear, get out of there. Go in, cry against the altar, get out. In fact, don't go the same way you came. Just get out of there fast. God didn't want him lingering in that area of Bethel and Israel because of their apostasy against the Lord. So we see here a very strong command from God. But then write down number two. Here's the second part of the story. A subtle temptation. Now enter in another character in the story, in verse 11, the old prophet. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king. Then they told also to their father. Now notice that this old prophet hears the exploits of the man of God. Word was beginning to spread all around Bethel of what had happened. And this old prophet is obviously a part of Jeroboam's kingdom. Why would he stay there? If he was really totally loyal and dedicated to the Lord, why would he stay there and sit under that kind of apostasy and false religion? One writer said this, he was not only in Bethel, but he was also of Bethel. He was loyal to Jeroboam's new regime. And this old prophet also may have been offended by the younger prophet's refusal to stay and to be entertained by the king and to receive his gifts. And he probably himself wanted to remove the shame that this young prophet had heaped upon the king and upon the city of Bethel and upon the altar itself. So he's determined to go find this young prophet and bring him back. So look in verse 13. And he said unto his son, saddle me at the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and he went after the man of God, and he found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto them, Art thou the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, I am. So he rides, and he finds this prophet sitting under the oak tree. By the way, this younger prophet is making a mistake here, if you ask me. You say, why? Well, he's lingering. Why are you lingering there in the land? What's taking you so long? Why do you have to rest under an oak tree? He was obviously there long enough for this older prophet to catch up to him, so he wasn't really in a hurry to get out of the land to obey the Lord's command. And this opens him up to a temptation because he lingers. Let me just tell you, beloved, when we are slow or reluctant to obey a command that God gives us, we open ourselves up to temptation. When God tells you to do something, don't linger. Be quick to obey. God, you know what he wants from us? He wants radical obedience. He wants us to do what he says quickly. And if you don't do what the Lord says quickly, then you may open yourself up for trouble. So look at verse 16. The man makes him the offer, come home and eat bread with me in verse 15. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, nor will I eat bread nor in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn against to go or turn again to go by the way that thou camest. Now, he clearly repeats the command that God gave him. There's no gray area here. There's no doubt about what God told him. God made it very specific. You go, you preach against the altar, you leave, you don't leave the same way that you came, you get out of there. It was very clear. In verse 17, the word of God is emphasized. It was said to me by the word of the Lord. God told me this. This was a command that God gave me. In fact, the whole emphasis of this chapter is the clarity and the faithfulness of the word of God. Nothing unclear about what God said. God said, get home without delay. And again, this gives us a lesson about temptation. This man had also just finished doing what God said. He came away from a great spiritual victory. Think about that. 
He did what the Lord said bravely. He condemned the altar bravely. He stood against the king bravely. He confronted this whole wicked religious system. Uh, He really rides off into the uh, wilderness victoriously. But let me tell you something. Sometimes the most subtle temptations will come to you after you've had a great spiritual victory, right after you've done what the Lord says. Sometimes that's when we are the most vulnerable. So there's a sense in which this prophet lets his guard down. He lingers in the wrong place. He doesn't get out of dodge like he should. And this is where the temptation gets subtle. This older prophet is determined to bring him back. So look at verse 18. And he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. You're not the only prophet around here, bud. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But what's the last sentence? But he lied unto him. This old prophet tells him a lie. He says that an angel came. God spoke to me. He says, basically, I have fresh revelation from God for you. I have a word of knowledge for you. God told me, in fact, through an angel to come and get you and to bring you back and for you to eat bread and to drink water. But all of it was made up. All of it was a lie. Let me tell you something, friends. You better be very careful when someone comes to you telling you that they have received a word of knowledge from God for you. You ever have anybody tell you that? I want to tell you, in my ministry, I've had a lot of people come to me and say, you know what? God told me to tell you something. I always brace when that happens. I know I'm about to get it. And I would have to tell you that I don't believe any time that has ever happened in my life that they had a real message from God to me. I think that when God wants to tell you something, he'll probably tell you specifically. He'll tell you through his word. He might tell you through preaching. And I'm not saying that's always untrue, but you better be careful that when someone comes to you with a word of knowledge, you better weigh it with the word of God. You better make sure that you compare it with God's clear word. This is one way to know a prophecy is false. When it goes against a clear command of God, you can rest assured that that is not a word from the Lord. God had already made very clear to this prophet what he was supposed to do. Now he's getting a word from an older prophet telling him to do the exact opposite. And it didn't come to him directly. It came through an angel, so to speak. This is what what, uh, Philip Ryken writes, and I think he's very right when he wrote this, he said this, this is the way some preachers gain control of their congregations and some Christians try to manipulate other people. Quote, God told me to do do this, they say. Or worse, God told me to tell you to do this. Be careful of that. This man of God from Judah should have known better than to simply listen to this man, this man who was living in Bethel, this man who was loyal to a false religious system, this man that wasn't really loyal to the worship of God the way God prescribed it in his word. But you know what made the temptation really bad when he said, oh, an angel from heaven came and told me to tell you this. You know what this reminds me of? The passage in the New Testament. Remember what Paul said to the Galatians? Look, if an angel from heaven comes and preaches you another gospel, Contrary to the gospel that I just gave you, let him be accursed, even if it's an angel, so-called. Did you know that many false cults and religions were started by angels, or so to, or they were said to be started by angels? That's what the founders of these religions said. For example, uh, Joseph Smith said that he had one night in, in 1823, he retired for bed and in his room there was a light and the light got brighter and brighter until finally the light in his room was brighter than the noonday sun and there was an angel there and this angel started giving him orders and commands from God and that's the way Mormonism was started through an angel that came to Joseph Smith. Islam, did you know Islam started by um, uh, Muhammad? Muhammad claimed that he would go to a cave and there meditate and there the, the angel Gabriel would come and meet him there and give him messages from God that he would write down, which now they said is all put together in the Quran, uh, sacred scripture of Islam. So basically that was started by an angel from heaven, and then on we could go. But you know, that shouldn't surprise us because what does the Bible say? When Satan comes, he comes as an angel of light. Here this prophet lies to him. 
He invites them with a seductive temptation. He gives them false revelation. He says an angel told him to do this, but none of that was true. And this man does something that is unthinkable. Look in verse 19. This younger prophet, the man of God from Judah, in verse 19, so he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drink water. This, man, this temptation was very seductive. This young prophet was unable to overcome it. He should have overcome it. He should have known better. He should have remembered Deuteronomy chapter 13, the warning that God gave there, verses 1 through 3. If there's a prophet that comes to you and claims to, uh, to speak for me and gives you even a sign, but he leads you away from my word or into false worship, you know that that is not a prophet of God. He should have remembered that. And then later on, there are verses that we know on, in the New Testament, what does John say in 1 John 4, 1? Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see what? Whether they are of God. You better be careful. You better try the spirits. And so the issue here is not simple disobedience, but this man of God from Judah, he failed to discern pro- false prophecy. He didn't test the spirits to see if they were from God, but he simply believed and he went back with this guy. I want you to see the third part of this story. We see a specific command. We see a subtle temptation, but I want you to see a severe judgment because look at verse 20, and it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah saying, thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and has not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but came his back and has eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which the Lord did say to thee, eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. Wow. While this young prophet is there in the home of this old prophet, he's eating and he's drinking. The old prophet gets a real message from God. This might seem strange to us. You know, why would God speak to this old prophet that had previously lied to him? Well, we need to remember that the word of God comes through sinful men. There are no sinless men. There are no flawless men through which God gives his word. Every uh, writer of Scripture was a sinner. And I would go so far as to say they were liars too because all of us are born liars. All of us are flawed. So God doesn't have any perfect people to work with. All he has to work with are sinners. And so, and by the way, you get a sermon every Sunday from a sinner. You're getting one tonight from a sinner. I'd love to tell you that I'm, you know, super spiritual, but I'm sorry, I'm a flawed sinner. Um, And I know that you believe that. I don't have to linger on that point too much. But it's the truth. Every sermon that comes across the pulpit every Sunday all over this country are preached by sinners. God uses flawed men, sinful men men to communicate his word. But this old prophet gives him a message. And the message is, since you wanted to linger here, and since you weren't in a hurry to get back to your land, you'll never return back home. In fact, you're going to die here, and you won't be buried with your fathers in the sepulcher of your fathers, which was customary in that day. Every family had a burial spot. And it was an honor to be buried with your loved ones. But this prophet wouldn't have that honor. God said, because you disobeyed me, you would die away from home. And and suffering further disgrace, you won't be buried with your own people. You'll be buried right here in this land. And the fulfillment of this came. In fact, look at verse 23. And it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it, the lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass, and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. So sure enough, on his journey back, this prophet from Judah was killed by the lion, And again, this is a very strange scene. You would have to admit this was a wonder to the people who saw it. Here this lion killed this man, but he didn't eat him. 
and neither did he eat the donkey that was there. This lion had no appetite. He lost his appetite, it seems. So it was a strange sight that when people would pass by, they would see the carcass of this prophet, they would see a lion standing next to it, and they would see the donkey there also next to it. And people that saw that put together that this was something that was unusual, but it was an object lesson to everyone there in Bethel. And what was the lesson? That you can't get away with disobeying the word of God. In fact, if a prophet will be judged by God for disobeying his word, don't you think ordinary people will also be judged? Don't you think even a a wicked king will also be judged if he continues to disobey the word of God? Now, when the old prophet hears what's happening because word is spreading around the city, he goes to see him and look in verse number 26. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, it is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him and slain him. Now, here's a key phrase, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. And we're beginning to see part of the theme of this whole chapter, the reliability of the word of God. Even though God's servants may not be reliable, God's word is always reliable. God's word will always come true. God's servants might lie, but God's word will not lie. God's word is true. And even this old prophet begins to see the message. You know what? This prophet... He spoke the real word of God, and he couldn't escape the power of that very word that he spoke. And so it's a message to him as well. And so what does he do? He goes to get him. Verse, And again, this might be um, a little disingenuous for the old prophet to accuse the other man of disobedience when really he was the one who kind of led him into it with his lies. Nevertheless, what the old prophet said was true. And look in verse 27, and he spake to his son, saying, Saddle me the ass. And they saddled him, and he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the, lion, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. And the lion had not eaten the carcass nor torn the ass. And so here's the lion doing nothing. And he collects the body of this prophet, the old man of God. And all of this, again, took place according to the word of the Lord in fulfillment of divine prophecy. Again, the message cannot be overemphasized. God's word never fails. And if true prophets can't escape the judgment of God's word, then no one else will. So this was a remarkable thing that happened here. And really, when you think about it, this old prophet from Bethel, he set out really to nullify the word of the Lord that came through this prophet by inviting him back. He was kind of trying to nullify that prophecy, but he realizes he couldn't. In the end, he was forced to bear witness to the enduring power and faithfulness of God's word. Notice the fourth part of this story. I call this a sad burial. So he buries him. Look at verse 28. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God and laid it upon the ass and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. Again, the old prophet is, uh, by doing this, by bringing him back to his city, by laying him in his own tomb, he's bestowing great respect on this man of God. And he genuinely mourns over him, saying, Alas, you are my brother. There is a sense in which they were spiritual brothers. And now the old prophet is very certain that whatever this young prophet said is going to come to pass. So look what he says in verse 31. And it came to pass after he had buried him that he spake to his son saying, when I am dead, then bury me in the sepulcher wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to Pass. Even though this man of God from Judah had died for his disobedience, the prophecy that he gave is still going to come to pass. When judgment would come, Bethel would be destroyed. The altar would be destroyed. The graves would be desecrated. And this is what the man of God had prophesied. The high place will be torn down. Human bones would be burned on the altar. 
And so the old prophet believed this prophecy, and he wanted to make sure that his grave wasn't disturbed or defiled like everyone else's around. So he said, when I die, lay me in the grave of this prophet, lay my bones next to his bones, hoping, what was, he, what was he hoping for? He was hoping to find safety just by being buried with this, this prophet, um, this true prophet. But again, this whole story was intended to teach Jeroboam and the Israelites the dangers of disobeying the word of God. Now, let me give you the fifth thing, and this is really where we want to apply it to us. This is what I call the spiritual application. We saw a specific command. We saw a subtle temptation. We saw a severe judgment. We saw a sad burial. But here's the fifth part. Here is a spiritual application because this whole story has an application for this divided people, and it has application for us. But before we can see what the story means for us, it's important to see what it meant to the original hearers. So first we'll apply it to Israel. Remember I said that this whole story really is a living parable. The tale of the two prophets really represents what will happen to the two kingdoms because each of these prophets represents their respective kingdoms. Remember that when after Solomon died, remember the kingdom divided, right? That was what God said would happen. Ten tribes to the north under Jeroboam, two tribes to the south under Rehoboam. You have the southern tribe or the southern kingdom of Judah, I should say. You have the northern kingdom of Israel. And so this is a divided people. And so really this story helps us to understand what's going to happen between these two nations, these two kingdoms. What will happen to them? Notice that in this story here, the names of the prophets aren't given. They're not identified by their name. How are they identified? They're identified by their geographical location. You have a tribe, or excuse me, you have a prophet from the kingdom of Judah. You have a prophet from the kingdom of Israel. This prophet from the kingdom of Judah represents the nation of Judah. And this prophet from the kingdom of Israel represents the nation of Israel. And again, it shows what happened to them in this story is what's going to happen to Israel and Judah. What happens? Well, the, the prophet from Judah, what does he do to the, uh, to the people in Bethel? He rebukes them. And this speaks about how the nation of Judah rebukes Israel for its false worship. After all, Judah is the way of true worship, right? The man of God came from Judah to rebuke, to rebuke Jeroboam, the king of Israel, for the ungodly worship. And in the same way, the kingdom of Judah was a witness to Israel as of the true way of worship. Judah, the capital city of Judah was Jerusalem. That was the home of God's true temple, the proper place for the atonement of sin. Judah, therefore, stood as a witness to Israel of the real way of salvation. They were also a rebuke to the nation of Israel for their false worship. But there's another thing. Israel entices Judah. What happens in the story? The old prophet, what does he do? He entices the young prophet from Judah. That's what's going to happen between these two nations. The nation of Israel will entice Judah to sin. In the same way that the old prophet tempted tempted the man of God by deceiving him, by lying to him, Israel would tempt Judah to practice their false religion. And in the end, both prophets turns out to be sinners. In the end, both kingdoms will fail the Lord. Both kingdoms will turn against God. The two nations would never reunite, but their people were brothers even until death. They were spiritual brothers, but they would fail the Lord, and they would never reunite. And so the Old Testament people of God could really see themselves in this story. Here's how one commentator summarize this living parable. Listen to what he said. The individuals mirror their kingdoms, and their tragedy portends the tragic destiny awaiting Israel and Judah. Israel has become unfaithful. Judah can speak the word that Israel needs to hear, but if Judah too, following Israel's lead, compromises its worship, as history shows it will do, then both are doomed to overcome their separation only in death. Judah will be buried in an alien land, and Israel will be saved only so far as it is joined to Judah. 
Just like the young prophet was buried in a foreign land, one day Israel will be carried away into captivity, and they will be buried in a foreign land because of their disobedience against the Lord. And so this whole story here was intended to serve as a warning. It was a warning to the people of Judah. Don't be deceived by Israel. It was a warning to the people of Israel. You better repent. You better turn to me. It was a warning to King Jeroboam that you can't disobey the word of God and get away with it. So did he receive this? Well, look down at verse number 33. Look at verse 33. After this thing, Jeroboam, now what does it mean by after this thing? After all this happened, after all these events took place, after this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way, but made again of the lowest of the people priests of the high places. Whosoever would, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing became sin under the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and destroy from the face of the earth. Even after all of this, Jeroboam doesn't repent. He had received the words of the prophet. He had suffered judgment himself with the withered hand. He had heard about the prophet's strange death on the road back to Judah. Jeroboam heard words of judgment that were attested by miracles of power. Yet with all these warnings that he received and with this message from this story, he still doesn't repent. He still doesn't abandon the high places and the false worship and obey the Lord. He returns to it. He comes right back to it. That was the application for Israel. Now, let me just give you one more thing and we're done. What about the application for us? What does this mean to us today? Well, let me just give you a few things that we can take from this story. Number one, be careful of your associations. Be careful who you associate with. Don't let anyone pull you down spiritually. You know, there are a lot of people out there that claim to be Christians that are not. They claim to really worship the Lord and speak for God, but they're really not. You better look at their life. You better be careful who you associate with because it's very easy to be pulled down by someone claiming to be a real believer. Use extra caution. And along with that, here's number two. Claims of revelation from God, as I said before, it needs to be tested. You need to be careful. What's the standard of testing it? Again, it's God's word. Everything that you hear, you better test it. And let me just say this. Don't believe everything I say just because I'm the one up here saying it. You better test it and make sure that what I'm telling you is from God. You better study the word of God on your own, and you better learn how to interpret it. And let me tell you, every time you see somebody on TV preaching or hear them on the radio, doesn't mean they really speak for God. You better use your own discernment. Use your own judgment. Again, John said, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Why, John? Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. There are many false prophets out there. And so when you have to listen, listen discerningly. Be discerning in the way you listen. Why? Don't believe everything you hear. That's what John says. We could translate like this. Stop believing every spirit. That's the, the idea of the Greek there. Stop believing everything you hear just because someone says it from a pulpit. Be discerning. And the second thing is um, you, you need to listen defensively, I should say. Defensively, that is, realize that Satan is out there. There's a lot of false prophets out there. There's many, John said, a lot. So you better listen defensively. And as you're listening, you say, does the Bible really say that? Does Scripture really prove that? You know, you know the old saying, you were taught to drive defensively? You know, what does that mean to drive defensively? It means that when you drive, you've got to look out realizing, think that everyone else around you is trying to cause you to crash. And so you have to be defensive in the way you drive. I, I forgot about this one night when I was driving home from church on a Wednesday night. A lady hit me in the side, turned me over several times. You all remember that? Miss Barbara Hilton was behind me. She thought I died. She called her husband and said, the pastor's dead. <laughs> and, uh, but thank God I rose again. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the Lord was very gracious. 
And the insurance people said, well, it wasn't your fault. But I started thinking about it. I thought, you know, really, it was my fault because I forgot one less, one thing I was taught, drive defensively. Remember, everyone out there is crazy. And, and you better be careful in the way you drive. They're trying to wreck you. And then we can say that in the spiritual world. Satan has got a lot of trying to wreck you spiritually. So you better be very defensive in the way that you listen. Let me give you the, the third and final thing here. And that is this, even if everyone else fails to tell the truth, God will still be true to his word. God will always be true to his word. Even if faithful prophets and preachers fail to tell the truth, God will always be true to his word. In fact, this whole episode is an illustration of something that Paul said, let God be true and every man a liar. One thing you can count on is the truthfulness of God's word. God's servants will fail. God never does. Now think about this story, and somehow, in some one way or another, every man in this story fails. They fail the word of God. Ralph Dale Davis describes how each responds to God's word. The word of God was Jeroboam's mercy. Davis says, yet he despised it by continuing the worship of false gods. For the man of God from Judah, the word of God was his safety, yet he abandoned it by disobeying and staying and eating and drinking in Bethel. For the old prophet of Bethel, the word of God was his profession, yet he abused it by claiming, that his, by claiming that his lie was the truth of God. Every one of these men was false, but the word of God was true. And their behavior could not overturn the power of God's word. They couldn't short-circuit the power of God's word. In each and every case, God's word still becomes, uh, still uh, comes true. And let me just give you this one final thought. You know, the old prophet thought, if, if you bury me with this younger prophet, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring salvation to me now. It didn't. That was not really the truth. Because being buried with the bones of an old prophet had no way of really providing any real salvation for him. But let me just say this. There's something, however, for us, that may not be true for him, but it is true for us because there was a real prophet who lived a long time ago who always told the truth. He was the son of God. He was the man of God from Bethlehem. And everything that he said was true. And his life was sinless. And he died, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again. And you know what the Bible says? If we believe the word of God, you know what we're going to be asked? Bury me with him. Bury me with him. In fact, that's what salvation is. What does the Bible say? When we come to Jesus, we're buried with him by baptism into death. And we will be raised like he was raised. There's a total oneness with Christ. The Bible says everyone who believes in Jesus has been buried with him in death. And just like he was raised from the dead, we too will live again. God has the power to make the dead come to life. So therefore, everyone who's buried with Christ, spiritually speaking, will rise with Christ from the grave and live forever. This is the true word of God. And there's nothing that can stop that, nothing. And the question is, do you believe in his word? Is your faith in his word? word that cannot be broken, that cannot be denied, that cannot be altered. Let's bow for prayer together tonight. Father, thank you for this story and for what it teaches us. It reminds us of the power of your word. It reminds us, Lord, that men are sinners. We're sinners. Even the best of us, we fail. We fall. But your word never does. It's always true. And our faith is not in any man. Our faith is in you. Our faith is in the Son of God, the risen Son of God. That's the only person our faith is in, no one else, because he is the living word of God. He is the personification of truth. And may our faith, Lord, be in you and in your word. And may we learn from this story to be careful of our associations. May we learn to test everything by the word of God. May we learn to put our faith in your word and nothing else. 
And if you're here tonight and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, I'd like to give you that opportunity right where you are. You can pray silently and say, Lord Jesus, I know that you did die for me, but you rose again. And now I'm asking you that I might be so united with you in death and burial that I also will have a resurrection. Save me, Lord Jesus. Make me your child. Just reach out to him in faith and tell him, Tell him you want to be saved. Tell him that you're a sinner. Put your faith in him. Father, thank you for, again, your word. And we pray that we'll take this with us wherever we go. May we always believe in the reliability and the power of your your word. We pray in your name. Amen.